I'm Jennifer Ferguson with Artistic Painting Studio and today I'm going to share with you one of my finishes called Hampton Point. And this is a fun project working with my Fowey rollers uh, and it can be done with any of the different roller patterns. Um, today I'm actually going to be working with chrysanthemum but you can choose any of the different patterns to work with. Um, so this is the roller that we are going to work with and we're actually going to be imprinting into a texture medium. Uh, so to start with, my texture medium is one of my own products under my own brand called Artsyville. Um, and this is just a great medium to roll the rollers through. Um, it's easy to trowel onto the surface and also really easy to work with. So this is what we're going to be starting with. Um, and there are a couple different ways to apply the product to the surface. So I'm going to show you a couple different tools to use and then you can choose whatever works best for you. Um, to start with, this is actually just um, a room key, like a hotel room key. Um, and they work wonderful because they're very flexible little styrene. Um, you could also just use a styrene trowel. I've seen some thin um, tools like in the cake decorating department um, at your hobby stores. Um, but this is the first one I'm going to show you. So I'm just going to go ahead and take out some of the texture medium and put it onto the key. And then you're just going to be using a real shallow um, angle to the, the key itself on applying the medium to the surface. Um, the one thing about when we're using the um, rollers is the thinner the medium is on here, the easier it is to work with. That way, you're not having to do a lot of sanding at the end. Um, so I would say just keep it on really thin. Uh, the other tool I want to show you is a spatula. And the spatula could be used or you could also try even using um, like a large style like putty knife would also work. Um, so that's another option. Again, you would just load the material onto the edge of the tool. And then this will cover a larger area so that you can get more, more coverage faster. So it's really going to depend also, I think, what just ends up being more comfortable for you and also the size of the area that you're actually working on. Now I'm going to show you my favorite tool, which is definitely a trowel. And this is my Japanese style trowel. Um, this is going to um, be the fastest for application. Again, you would just load onto the side. I'm um, being right-handed. I'm always going to load on the right side of my trowel. And this just, again, is something that you use at a very low angle and just apply the product to the surface. So however it is that you can get the material onto um, the surface area that you're working on, um, it doesn't matter. Um, I know some people have actually even used um, a brush, like a foam brush. Uh, like I said, the cake decorating department um, has some flexible tools that are a little bit larger than just um, a room key. Uh, I'm just going to finish getting this on here. And don't worry about it being perfect. Don't worry about trying to have the same thickness everywhere because no matter what, you're going to have areas that are going to be thinner and some that are going to be thicker. And just go for it. Don't worry. Um, so once you have the material on there, then we are going to go to our roller and go ahead and make an imprint through it. Uh, the first thing I always like to check is spin the head of the roller and make sure that it's uh, freely spinning on there because you don't want to get um, a slide or a drag while you're actually trying to do the rolling. And then the other thing I always try to do is make sure I've got some point where I'm going to try to keep the roller straight with so that my first pass is straight and then all the rest of your passes will follow that. So, I'm going to do so all you want to do is just roll from top to bottom and I'm not worrying about trying to match the pattern up. I am just going next to it, the design, and just keep rolling. And as soon as I'm done with this, we're going to come in here for a closer shot so we can get an up close of what you're seeing me do. So when we get close here, you can see there are areas that are thinner and some areas that are thicker. 
and this is normal. It actually allows for um, uniqueness in the pattern that you're not going to have it um, completely consistent. Um, the areas that you see that are high peaked, those will come back and sand um, when it is completely dry. My first layer has dried and now I'm ready to start going forward. Um, at this point, you want to check for the, how rough the finish is. And like I had said earlier, basically you just want to go ahead and sand off any of the high areas that are rough. Um, and that way um, it's not rough to the touch. But we don't want to sand too much because we don't want to lose our pattern. Um, I do recommend using um, a sanding block. And I like how it has a flat surface. So it only is going to hit the high areas. It won't allow you to get into the low area of the pattern. And I always recommend be safe and put on a mask before you start sanding. And just quickly take off any of the high areas um, that might have peaked up from the roller. Um, at this point, I would just go ahead and dust off the surface and make sure it's ready to be painted. Um, the next layer that we're going to do is go ahead and paint uh, the texture with Debbie's Design Diary DIY paint. And the color I chose for this project is sea glass. And I'm just going to go ahead and use, I'm using a dense foam roller, and I'm just using a little foam plate to get the paint onto the roller, and then paint the surface. Now, I'm just going to show you painting on one layer here, but I do recommend, and always with uh, most of my painting, put on two layers so that you have good, full, opaque coverage. And we're going to come back in distress, and I want to be able to distress where I want, not to have the paint thin in the area just because I didn't apply enough paint. Um, with the um, DIY paint, um, when it's wet, it is darker than it will be when it's dry. So I do recommend um, making a sample first and making sure that you like the way the color looks when it's dry, when it's waxed, when it's glazed, whatever you're going to do to it. Make sure you like the color. Uh, because sometimes it can be deceiving um, that it's this dark when it is wet and it's going to dry this light down here. So I've already painted the lower section of my sample board with the two coats and it's dry and ready to go to the next, um, the next process on this. Um, and I know from back there, I'm going to go ahead and bring you guys in for a nice close-up shot here for a second, okay? Here you can actually see the pattern um, and that it's nice and opaque. The paint's dry and we're ready to go to the next section. So at this point, I'm ready and I'm going to do what is called um, wet sanding on here, which is a distressing technique where I basically want to just take off um, the high areas of the paint on the pattern so the design pops more. Um, you could do it a couple of ways. You can actually put the water, um, just squirt a little bit of water onto your sandpaper and sand this way. Or you can even lightly mist the whole surface. And I say lightly because when you're using sandpaper, um, you can break through really quick and take off too much. So I'm just doing a little circular motion, trying to keep a real light hand. And as you can see, I'm bringing back the texture medium where it's removing the paint on the high areas so that the design is popping. And then I can just keep my sandpaper a little bit cleaner by just removing a little bit of the paint off of it and continue along this area of my sample. So how much you decide to remove is totally personal. Um, and, you know, you can just, you know, take off as much or distress as much or as little as you want. I'm just lightly misting that again. And right now I'm just going to the straight sanding block here because uh, I don't want to remove too much. And I wanted a little bit um, lower grit or uh, smoother, smoother sandpaper. The other one I had was a little rough, but that removes things fast. So that's all you do in this layer and with all of your chalk paints, um, you want to make sure that you completely allow this to dry before you go to the next process. 
So we're going to wait for this to dry and we'll be back in a minute for the next layer. So my sample has dried when I did the wet distressing and you want to make sure it's dry before you go to the next layer. And the next thing that we're actually going to do on here is apply a wax finish. And I'm again using um, Debbie's Design Diary DIY um, paints and this is the clear wax. Um, there are a couple ways to actually apply the wax to the surface. Um, you can use a wax brush and this is my European wax brush. Um, and I've just pulled the um, wax out and put it onto a, a foam plate. I prefer to always use um, some kind of a plate or a palette versus actually loading my um, brush out of the jar, okay? So you just want to pick up a little bit of wax and when using the brush you're just going to be doing a circular motion and you can see immediately that the wax deepens the color drastically. But again, when it dries, it will dry back to the lighter color. So you just continue to use the circular motion. And with wax, I feel less is best. You don't want to build up a really thick layer of wax. So I just do um, a thin layer. And if I wanted to do, you know, a couple of layers of wax, I still would just rather do a couple of layers of thin than to try to pile it on here too thick. The other thing I like to use when I'm on bigger surfaces that are flat, like a tabletop, um, then I would definitely be using some cheesecloth. So I'm loading the cheesecloth up with some of the wax. And again, I'm going to stay with that circular motion. And you can see that you can actually go a little bit faster with this process. Even though my easel here is kind of moving a little bit. Um, and then I'm just trying to make sure I have 100% coverage. And because I'm going to do also um, dark wax on top of the clear wax, I always like to let the um, clear wax completely dry before I move forward, or at least have the clear wax underneath your dark wax because it gives you more control. Um, so once you have the clear wax on, and my bottom section already has the clear wax on here. Um, I'm also going to stop here for a second and bring you into another close-up so you can see how it looks right after you have clear waxed. This is a close-up of the sample once the clear wax has dried. Once my clear wax is dried, now I'm ready for the process of adding the dark wax. And the dark wax is a personal preference. Um, you don't have to add it. It just depends on if you want to age the project and make it look a little bit more weathered and old. It's always a, another app or another option. And again, you can add with a wax brush. And I just want to do a little bit. I don't want to get it too dark. And you can control it. And even if I wanted to randomly add it here and there, and then I'm going to switch to my cheesecloth because I feel there's just more control with this application, especially with the dark wax. Now, the nice thing about having the clear wax underneath is you can pull off as almost as much of the dark wax as you want. So how much you leave behind is just kind of a personal preference. Um, but it's going to deepen the finish, it's going to age it a little bit, um, give it some depth and dimension, and it's definitely bringing out the roller design, which is wonderful. So that's really coming alive. But anytime I'm using the dark wax, um, I always recommend make sure you have the clear wax underneath as of the control factor. If you don't have the clear wax underneath, the dark wax will grab the paint really quick, um, go very dark, and then doesn't give you much forgiving of being able to remove it. So you're always better off with the clear first. Well, once I have this finished here, I'm gonna bring you in for a close-up, and then we'll also share with you at the end of this video 
uh, the project that I completed with this finish. So I did a little tiny side table and just did the top of it. Um, but it's nice to kind of see uh, the finish completed on a project. So you will find listed at the beginning as well as the end of this video all the tools and supplies that you need to create this project. Um, we're going to give you a close-up of this. And then again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the process.